blessing of all, the gift of yourself in human flesh, Jesus Christ. We joyfully acknowledge that our hope in you is not misplaced. We choose to serve you because you chose to touch our lives so graciously in Christ. May our faithful witness and the service of our lives reveal the depth of your love and our love and our gratitude as we worship you, O oh God, and as we praise and adore you in Jesus' name and in the power of the Holy Spirit.
serve beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us along all the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. So Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm. And consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. He said, Then put away the foreign gods that are among you, and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, the Lord our God, we will serve, and him we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made statutes and ordinances for them as shepherds. Friends, this is the word of the Lord for you and I, the children of God. Thanks be to God. We come now to our time of confession before the Lord and one another. We will pray together here in just a bit. The first part of our prayer will be in silence. And again, like we do every week, I implore you to do an honest reflection, an honest inventory of the week that just passed. Think of those things you know you probably shouldn't have said, those things you probably shouldn't have done, those things you probably should not have thought. Earnestly bring those to the Lord seeking forgiveness, knowing that our Lord is just and merciful and is willing to forgive if only we come to Him with a honest and contrite heart. Let us now pray together our prayers of confession. O oh Lord our God, we gather today before you, conscious of our many failures, including our failure to be faithful to your word. We are very conscious, too, of our failure to share the good news of your merciful love and your gracious commitment to your creation and to all humanity, whom you created with a divine spark to enrich and enliven them. We gather to confess our failure to learn from past lessons, both individually and collectively as the people before God. Merciful God, forgive our deliberate acts of turning away from you and your ways, our apathy towards the truth of your involvement with humanity over countless generations, and our thoughtless acts of stubbornness in seeking to live to please our own selfish yet fleeting desires and ambitions. Holy God, we seek your merciful forgiveness for our failure sometimes to share with our children and our children's children the truth about you about your love, your compassion that we are blessed to receive. We ask that you inspire us with a zeal for sharing the good news of God, to encourage us in our attempts to tell others what God has done for us throughout our lives, and to empower us with a clear understanding of our own faith and trust in you and your ways of justice and peace. Unchanging God, help us to listen for the many tones and accents of God's voice as it continues to sound softly and gently or strongly and vibrantly through all time and eternity. Open our ears and our eyes to your presence with us each and every day, so 
that we may recognize you at work in our lives and in the lives of people within our community. And also to recognize in the way that you and your wisdom use your people to fulfill your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Friends, I want to repeat to you the good news that we shared with one another last week when we gathered before Holy Communion. Christ Jesus died for each and every one of us while we were yet sinners. Proving just how much God dearly loves each and every one of us. And so, friends, in the name of Christ Jesus, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. I want to invite you now to join me as though we are many persons who say in one voice our statement of faith, our confession of faith, those things we know to be true, those things we believe in our soul, those words as contained in our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate,
only to find out a few hours later that I had fallen asleep. It's now one or two o'clock in the morning. I fell victim to that a number of times, even if I tried to pour tons of coffee down my throat. Even now, there are times when I go to pick up Ray at the car line of school that I'm sitting there and I'm doing some work, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> and I had to look around and make sure my windows were not rolled down to see if anybody else. <laughs> but falling asleep on the job, drifting off when I needed to be paying attention, I think that may have happened to just about all of us. Well, that's what's happening to these ten bridesmaids in our lesson we just read this morning from Matthew. But in order to fully appreciate the impact of the story, we need to know a little something about what first century Jewish wedding ceremonies look like and wedding customs. You see, in those days, you got married in kind of three distinct stages. First, you had the engagement period, usually set up between the parents of both the bride and the groom. That could last a few months, it could even last up to a year or more. But then after that engagement period came the formal ceremony in the home of the bride. It's kind of like what we do now in our modern contemporary world. And then third, you had a wedding banquet or a feast over at the groom's house. Usually that took place at night. And usually these banquets will last up to four, five, six, seven days. If you think back to Jesus' first reported miracle of the wedding at Cana, that's why he ran out of wine. Because that banquet lasted for about seven days. It's quite an elaborate affair, these wedding banquets. And everybody wanted to be a part of the banquet. And when it was time for the banquet, what happened is that the bride and the groom who were at the groom's house would walk, sorry, the bride's house, would walk from the bride's house over to the groom's house. And because it was at night, one of the duties of the wedding party when the bride made in our story was to light the path from the bride's house all the way to the groom's. It would be a major breach of etiquette for any member of the wedding party not to be there, ready to welcome the bride and groom from the bride's house to the groom's house. Now, in our parable this morning, half of these young women didn't think about just how long it may take for the bride and groom to arrive. And so they grabbed their lamps and they ran off to the meeting place without bringing enough oil to burn in their lamps in the event that he was a little bit delayed. They figured, well, certainly I got enough, and if I don't, I'll just borrow from, the, from my buddies. Jesus says these women were foolish. Or if you actually translate the Greek word used here, it actually means stupid. The other five, on the other hand, they thought ahead. Jesus says they were prudent, but they were wise. They were there to bring extra oil with them in the event that the bride and groom came later and expected. And so all ten, they light their lamps, and they wait for the bridegroom to arrive. Bridegroom, running a little bit later than expected. We don't know why, he just is. And so all ten fall asleep. All ten of them. Not a single one of them stayed awake while waiting for the bridegroom. They all fell asleep on the job. Only when somebody shouted at them, hey, the bridegroom's coming, did they wake up? And they trimmed their lamps and they tried to relight them. It is only at this point that the foolish ones realize, hey, my lamp is stuttering, or I can't get mine to light. What to do? So they asked their friends, hey, can I borrow some of yours? The friends said, no, you can't borrow some of ours. If we lend out our oil to you, then nobody's going to have enough. And no one is going to be ready when the bridegroom comes. That would be showing him the proper respect that he is due. So the five foolish ones have to go find oil somewhere else. So often Dollar General, I guess, they went to try to find oil. <laughs> but while they're gone, the bridegroom arrives. And the ones that were wise, the ones that were prudent, walk with him into the banquet, and they shut the door. And the foolish ones were left outside. Even when they arrive, now fully prepared, they think, calling to them, Lord, let us in. Now we're ready. What happened? They're not allowed to join the feast. And Jesus
themselves fall asleep. Yeah, but all ten of them fell asleep. No one that gave them five stayed awake. All ten fell asleep. What's of more interest to me this morning, as I continue to read through this parable this week, is the oil. Why is the oil so important? Why does the oil seem to be the thing to which this whole parable revolves around? What does it really mean? What does it really represent? What's going on here? This is a parable about what it's going to look like when the Son of Man comes. And the parable reminds me of something that happened to me a number of years ago when I inadvertently ran a 10-mile race in Chapel Hill. You say, how do you inadvertently run a 10-mile race? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Every spring at Carolina, they have what's referred to as the Tar Heel 10 Mile. It's a 10 mile race throughout the campus and Chapel Hill neighborhoods. But they also have a four mile race that takes place at the same time. And so one particular spring, I decided to run the four mile, I signed up to run the 10 mile. But as we got closer to the race, I didn't feel like I was prepared. I didn't feel like I'd done enough to be ready to run 10 miles at one time. So we got in contact with the race organizer and said, look, I'm not ready. Is it okay instead of running 10 mile, I just run the four mile? Of course, they already got the money, so they don't care. But they sure do whatever you got to do. So I had my mind, I'll run four miles on that day. Now, both races started at the exact same place at the exact same time. And both races finished at the same place, inside the football stage. And in fact, they filmed you crossing the finish line and put it up on the big jumbo trial on the school board they had. The difference, of course, is somewhere in the middle. Whereas the four mile goes one way, the ten mile goes another way. Now, an astute racer, one that was well prepared for what he or she was going to face, would probably take a look at the race map before the race to see exactly where the split was. And honestly, just about everybody did. That one person. <laughs> The starting gun goes off, and this giant mass of people all start running at the same place down the same road. It's a sight to behold, I'm sure. And I run a little bit faster pace than Heidi does. So she said, I'm fine, just want to go ahead and go ahead. So I did. And mile one, hey, mile one was great. I'm a picture of confidence. Right? <laughs> not up front, not way back, kind of happy medium, you know, where you want to be. Get to mile two, still feeling pretty good. Get to mile three, and where we were in Chapel Hill, and where the football stadium, I thought to myself, I really feel like that's more than a mile away. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe they know some kind of a shortcut that I don't. <laughs> so I kept on the same path. Then I get to mile four, then I get to mile five. I noticed that this big group of people that I was running with, my buddies, all of a sudden, that shrunk down quite a bit. And it's just a few of them. Get to mile six, get to mile seven, and I stop and I ask one of the race directors at one of the water stations, and I was supposed to run the four mile. And he said, dude, that's way back from the other one. Now, I did end up finishing all 10 miles. And it was not a pretty sight. When I saw myself rumbling and bumbling and stumbling toward the finish line with a giant jumbo truck <laughs> there, keeping the Lord as But while it is true, I was not shut out of any kind of wedding feast. I certainly was unprepared with what was presented to me on that day. And I feel like the oil in our story is kind of like preparing for that race. Yeah. <laughs> Just as preparation by paying attention was necessary for me to be ready to run the correct race, the oil that the bridesmaids have here, and in fact, the oil that all of us who trust in Christ have, is necessary for being ready for when Christ the bridegroom arrives, regardless of when he comes, whether it's when we are awake, as we are right now, when we are asleep, having passed away and waiting to be raised up. One of my Bible commentaries this week made the point that the virgins or the bridesmaids didn't know exactly when the bridegroom was going to arrive. But they knew that when he did, it would be all of a sudden. And they wouldn't have time to get ready upon his arrival. They just had to be prepared 
returns in his glory. This presents us with a question, does it not? Are we prepared for Christ's return? Are we ready? Have we been wise in our preparation for his coming so that we will be ready for him whether he comes when we are awake or when he comes after we are asleep? Do we have what we need to honor our bridegroom when he comes? I guess that depends on what we mean by prepared, doesn't it? Again, this comes from one of my commentaries. I want to read it to you. It says, depending on a person's situation and spiritual need, the oil may stand now for this Christian truth, for this important reality. Repentance is obviously needed. If one is to be ready to welcome Christ Jesus when he returns, and so is true and humble faith. Perseverance and courage will be the needed gifts at times, and many will be the times when humility will keep me ever watching. Willingness to suffer for the name of Christ and to deny myself are key. Sorrowful awareness of the world's brokenness and a longing for God's name to be hallowed on the earth. These two can be the oil, ever ready in our vessels. Whatever it takes to be ready to receive and honor the king when he comes, this parable teaches us to desire those Brothers and sisters in Christ, are we ready for the King when He comes? Or will we be caught having become complacent with the world around us, not having done any kind of preparation for His coming? Have we lost sight of who we are in Christ? Have we forgotten what Christ came to do? And how that should be mirrored in our life together in the church. Are we focused on preaching? Are we focused on teaching? Are we focused on healing one another? Have we neglected his word and sacraments? Have we become comfortable in our sin? Have we become unwilling to change and repent from the evils, both large and small, that we do? Actively overlooking the logs in our own eyes we search for each and every speck in the eyes of others? Have we ceased desiring God's justice and become complacent with sin's injustice in the world? Have we ceased to think on whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, excellent, or praiseworthy? Are we just giving God lip service? Friends, when our king comes, there will be no time to do these things if we have fallen asleep. Whether that means if we have passed away or if we've been caught unaware. And Jesus is very clear about this. Those who neglect any kind of preparation for his coming will be just like the seeds that fell on rocky soil. Their faith will have no root. Their life will have no oil with which to burn. There will be no fuel with which to relight their lamps and no fresh wicks to trim. They will cry, Lord, Lord. But he will not know them. And the door will be closed. Friends, this parable serves as a wake-up call to us. As with all things, there is always hope. There is hope for us if we fear we may be unready or unprepared. Indeed, being ready requires constant practice of what I just spoke of. But we can do none of the things that serve as the oil in our lamps without faith in Christ as our Savior and without the help of the Holy Spirit. Christ died and rose again to break the bonds of sin, death, and hell that once bound us and made us entirely unworthy. To enter into his kingdom. And when we trust that, that, that his death and resurrection was indeed for us, and that he has saved us from our sins, then he sends us the Holy Spirit to teach us and to guide us in the way that we should live, to lead us to the sacraments, those fruit which makes my soul thrive and to keep our dying faiths alive, to drive us to repentance and to hear and receive God's absolution, to 
to hear and meditate on his word and receive comfort from it, to do good works for our neighbors and to lift one another up when we stumble, to see the hurt and the pain that is in this world and to pray to God yearning for his justice and mercy, to be courageous in our faith when faced with adversity, to think of whatever is pure, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. And friends, to call on our Lord in every trouble, to pray, to praise, and to give Him thanks. Friends, only Christ can give us the oil we need to keep our lamps trimmed and burning as we watch for His final coming. When we trust in Him, Seeing what he has done and believing in the promise that he gives us, that he fills our bottles with whatever we need to be ready for his coming. And he guides us in our preparation so that even if the sleep of death overtakes us and our way for his arrival, even if we fall asleep on the job, friend, we will be ready when he comes and we will join him in his wedding. Friends, when we trust Him, He won't bar us from the bank of all. And thanks be to God for that. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
here on the way out. Shake your hand and make your way out also. <laughs> but I do want to say thank you to everybody who has been faithful with your continued giving. I also want to say a future thank you for anticipating giving because as we have seen throughout this year that faithful people find ways to remain faithful. So I can't say thank you enough. So in appreciation of your past giving and in anticipation of your future giving, I want to offer up to you these words of prayer. Let us pray. Ever vigilant God, you watch us, watch over us every night as we sleep and every day as we rise to do our work and as we gather at tables to feast on the food you provide. Your care for us is never ceasing. We long to be as vigilant as we strive to be the kingdom ready church you desire here on earth. Help us to keep our eyes and ears open to the needs around us. May we give so generously that when it is time to close our eyes and sleep, we will rest knowing we have been faithful and vigilant in our caring and compassion. In Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, friends, that brings us to the close of our worship service here this morning. As we bring things to a close, remember we're exiting out through this door. So I'm going to go back through uh, this way. I guess I'll go this way and then around. Right? And then hopefully by next week we'll have everything good and ready to go. So, anyway, hear now these words of our benediction. In the presence of the Lord, we have reflected on his words about wisdom and vigilance. What are we, foolish or wise? Probably a little bit of both. Foolish when we sin, wise when we are vigilant and try to live a bit like Jesus and to put his words into practice. The Almighty God keep you vigilant and wise and bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go in the peace of the Lord and may he keep you always faithful. Thanks be to God. Amen.